So before I make my introductions here, I would like to give a shout out to the folks that are watching us on through the webcast. I was told that yesterday there were over 500 people. I don't know what the count is today, but that's really amazing. So hello to all of you and thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Brian Wallet, who is working together with Dr. Avi Nath to oversee and implement the intramural clinical study on ME-CFS. Dr. Nath is not able to be with us today, so Brian has kindly agreed to step in and provide this update. So welcome, Dr. Wallet. Thank you, Vicki. Here we go. I'm Brian Wallet, and I'll be presenting the update on the post-infectious ME-CFS protocol here at NIH. Unfortunately, Dr. Nath uh, was scheduled to give this talk, but can't be here. It really has been a privilege to work with Avi, and he has given me the privilege of giving this talk to you today. As most of you know, uh, the focus of our protocol here at NIH is to study post-infectious myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. The overarching hypothesis to the program is that PI-ME-CFS is triggered by an infectious illness, and that results in immune-mediated brain dysfunction. Uh, the program is thought to be sort of a multi-phase program, uh, but we're going to focus today only on the first phase and what we're doing these days, which is the conduct of our cross-sectional study to deeply phenotype patients with PI-ME-CFS and to better define its pathophysiology. Uh, as you can imagine, selecting the proper patients for any study is very important, and perhaps doubly or triply so uh, for PI-ME-CFS. And it has been quite the challenge to identify the best population to bring here to NIH. And we have received a great deal of feedback and useful feedback from the community in this regard. Uh, what we are doing now to select our patients is we start with looking at medical records to find documentation of a life-changing onset of symptoms that occurs after an acute infectious process. We look to see if people who are participants have fatigue and post-exertion malaise for more than six months, but less than five years. Participants must meet ME-CFS case definitions, such as the Fukuda Canadian Consensus and Institute of Medicine criteria. And perhaps most importantly, after they undergo a full evaluation here at NIH, we must have unanimous agreement from a panel of expert clinical adjudicators who review our cases with us. Some of those folks are in the audience, and uh, we are very grateful for their time that they have put in to adjudicating our cases. Thank you again. While there are three different study populations that will be involved in this part of the study, today's talk will only focus on two of those, our patients and our healthy volunteers. We often get questions about our recruitment to the study, and today we'll review that for you. To date, we have had 367 total inquiries to participate in the study. And after our initial telephone screening process, we have screened out 186 of those individuals. The reasons for people being screened out at the telephone screen um, are medical and some are protocol related. Uh, medical exclusions um, most commonly were related to having a Lyme diagnosis and treatment. Uh, which are about 6.5% of individuals calling. Um, autoimmune disorders were not uncommon, along with head injuries and concussions being related to the onset of symptoms, about 5% each. Cancer and neurologic disorders are also represented. But um, a whole array of medical disorders um, represent around 27% of the reasons why people are excluded uh, on telephone calls. In regards to our protocol-specific exclusions, um, the most overwhelming reason people are excluded are because of the onset of their symptoms being more than five years, around 70 percent of individuals. Uh, we have had one individual call whose symptoms had not yet met six months. Um, if uh, that person still has symptoms in six months, they are, we will rescreen them, but we are very hopeful that we will not get a call back and that they will be better. Um, no infection uh, as a cause of their ME-CFS um, has excluded around 20 percent of individuals. Um, not having a formal fatiguing diagnosis, excluded around 7.5% of individuals. Um, issues with severity, being too sick to travel or too sick to bicycle, um, take around 10% of the exclusions. 
um, not meeting our age criteria pushed out around 6.5% of individuals, and unwillingness to have procedures or dropping out or not responding to our calls um, excluded an additional 1% of individuals. Of course, this is not a mutually exclusive list, and about a third of people uh, calling had multiple reasons for exclusion. After our telephone process, uh, I interviewed 181 individuals and reviewed their medical records. And after that process, an additional 130 people were screened out of the protocol. The reasons that people were screened out after interview and medical record review are, again, medical and protocol-specific ones. Um, there were 23 medical exclusions, um, the most common being a concomitant inflammatory disorder. Head injuries were also not uncommon, as well as uh, severe enough medical sleeping disorders that would confound an ME-CFS diagnosis. Immunodeficiencies, endocrine disorders, cancers, childhood epilepsy, and hepatitis B um, were more incidental exclusions. There were also some psychological exclusions for uh, participants. Uh, five participants had medical records of psychosis uh, that excluded them. Two had severe depression that were uh, beyond what one would call uh, community normals, along with uh, severe PTSD and severe anxiety, uh, excluding those additional people. In terms of the study protocol itself, um, 100 people were excluded. Most of them were because of medical record review. Um, we found that the onset of their symptoms predated their infection or um, were more than five years prior uh, to their infection. Um, 26 individuals didn't have any record of infection on medical record review. Ten individuals were undergoing uh, persistent treatment for Lyme disease um, on medical review and were excluded. Nine participants had taken medications that would exclude one from participation. Seven individuals had fatigue prior to their infection within the time limits. And two participants had recovered enough that it would be hard to consider them to have moderately severe fatigue still. Uh, and so we were unable to include them. There were some participant exclusions as well. 13 individuals uh, dropped out or lost contact with us. Some were unwilling to have their procedures. And there was in one case where a, a physician of the participant uh, was unwilling to support their participation. So after that entire process, to date, we have invited uh, 21 healthy volunteers and 22 ME-CFS patients to come to campus to have their visit one uh, deep phenotyping study. Um, to date, 13 individuals have been adjudicated as PI ME-CFS cases. Four participants have been adjudicated out. And there are three cases still pending adjudication. So what do we do in terms of our medical evaluation here at NIH? Well, we do a, a lot of different things. Uh, we collect uh, pretty detailed histories of people's life experiences, uh, profiles of patient symptoms. We have an independent internal medicine evaluation, neurological evaluation, and rheumatological evaluation for each participant. We review medications and symptoms. But what is really special about working here at NIH is that the world's experts in almost every disorder sit somewhere in this building. And whenever we come across something that we feel needs to be looked at a little more deeply and understood a little bit better, uh, we're able to give them a call and they, they come and see our patients for us. And uh, this has been a great help uh, to our protocol to both include and exclude and better understand our participants. And I'd like to say a special thanks to all of our NIH specialists that have helped us out with this protocol. In terms of our deep phenotype measurements, this is not a comprehensive list, but I figured I'd put something up that you guys can look at after the talk to see what we're doing. Um, this also gives you a sense of all the different uh, parts of the NIH intramural program that are contributing to what we're studying here. And some of this information is used in our clinical decision making, and some of this will be used as, uh, as research measures. So to date, 21 healthy volunteers have come to campus to participate in our visit one. All of the healthy volunteers had no complaints of fatigue or post-exertional malaise. One participant came to campus and withdrew early. Um, it, her family uh, was not comfortable with her continued participation, and she withdrew. Three participants were excluded based on their medical evaluation by our staff. They thought they were healthy volunteers, and we had to break the bad news that they were not quite as healthy as they had thought. 
One of the participants had a marked elevation in their white blood cell counts in their cerebral spinal fluid for reasons that are still not 100% clear. One participant had marked demyelination on their brain MRI. On further questioning, it, we believe that a Epstein-Barr infection two decades prior led to sort of diffuse demyelination, um, which makes them not quite normal and usable in our study. Um, one of our participants, after examination, uh, we felt that they had uh, changes that were really consistent with an early onset dementia uh, that had not quite uh, shown itself fully yet and also was unusable as a healthy volunteer. So to date, we have 17 what we would call certified healthy volunteers that we can use as comparators. And uh, one of those is actually a sibling to one of our MACFS participants, uh, which uh, both gender and almost age match which should be very interesting to, in our exploratory work to look at people that are so genetically similar. We've had 22 MECFS participants come to campus um, to participate in our visit one. All of the participants coming met criteria for having substantial fatigue and post-exertional malaise. We had one participant come to campus and uh, withdraw early, deciding that this study wasn't really uh, for that person. And we've had four participants that were excluded based on their NIH evaluations. One of the participants was discovered to have a very rare cancer um, and actually ended up passing away. We had one uh, participant who had an atypical myositis, um, which we can understand why it was so confounding to uh, all of the physicians that had seen that participant prior. One participant seems to have signs of uh, Parkinsonianism uh, that makes them sort of hard to qualify as a MECFS participant. And one of the participants had confounding legal issues that would have made it impossible for impartial adjudication. Uh, after the adjudication process, four of the participants were thought uh, on review of all the details of their case not to really be post-infectious. To date, we've had 20 cases that have completed all the measurements, that would meet the criteria for MECFS. And we've had 11 cases that would meet the criteria for PI MECFS that we set for ourselves, and three pending cases that are undergoing review. So where are we now? Um, the number of MECFS and healthy volunteer participants that we have completed is now robust enough for us to start our interim analyses. There are two major goals of our interim analyses that we will be uh, seeking here. Um, the first is to screen for measurable and substantial biological differences in our assays between the healthy volunteers and the PI MECFS patient. This is for two purposes. The first is to help us refine, improve, and expand our NIH study methods for the rest of the cohort going forward. Um, in areas that we are seeing change, we may add assays to expand and better understand what those changes are. We will also be using this to help us start to identify mechanisms that have the potential for therapeutic intervention. Um, this is part of the overarching uh, structure of the program, um, is to take the information here and to translate it into intervention, and we'll be starting that process um, with this interim analysis. Also, we will be looking to determine areas where it would be futile to continue searching for biologic differences. Our cohort will never be epidemiologically sized here at NIH, and we'll be able to tell if some of the avenues that we're pursuing are futile to continue. And that will help us reduce the study burden on our participants, help us do less to them, and also optimize how we are using our study resources. I figured that I would provide you two examples of our interim analyses. We'll talk a little bit about our mitochondrial function assays using Seahorse that are being performed by our colleagues at the National Institute of Nursing Research, Lee Ray Saligan and Rebecca Feng. And we'll talk a bit about our cerebral spinal fluid flow uh, cytometry analysis done by our colleagues at the National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke, Steve Jacobson and Yoshimi Akahata. I choose these two to talk about today because they highlight some of the real strengths of the intramural program, uh, which is how we collect samples. Um, both of these are live cell studies, and uh, cell viability is a major issue when it comes to live cell work. And here at the NIH, uh, we're able to measure the time between sample collection and analysis within minutes rather than hours or days or weeks. 
and I think that's sort of special. Mitochondrial function has been spoken about uh, quite a bit here at the conference. I figured I would show you a picture of mitochondria and a little cartoon that reminds you that oxygen is the coin of the realm when it comes to energy production by mitochondria. For our study, we are using the Seahorse XFP analyzer, which is able to understand oxygen consumption um, that occurs uh, from mitochondrial use at the cellular level. Um, usually when people talk about the CRS assay, they talk about the cartoon on your left. Um, when you put cells into the plates, uh, you initially get measurements of uh, oxygen consumption rates, and that will give you sort of a sense of the basal respiration of the cells that you are measuring. First, you, first step of the seahorse is to inject oligomycin, which blocks complex five of the electron transport chain and sort of turns off basic ATP production, helping you get a sense of how much ATP one is making by subtraction and giving you a sense of how much proton leak is occurring. The second step is to inject a compound called FCCP, which decouples the mitochondrial membrane and really sort of pushes the mitochondria into overdrive, into a maximal respiratory state, where you get a real sense of the, the maximum capacity that a mitochondria can have. After that step, a third step injects antimycin A and rotenone, which block the complex one and complex three of the electron transport chain, essentially shutting off ATP production and giving a sense of non-mitochondrial respiration. In a webinar that uh, Avi participated in in 2017, he showed the cartoon on the right, uh, which showed a single participant and a single healthy volunteer results from the seahorse assay. Here you see that in terms of maximal respiration, that the healthy volunteers seem to be more capable than the participant. Well, we've done a lot more of these seahorse assays now, and it turns out that was a, a trick because we're actually seeing that the opposite seems to be true, um, at least in the small amount of patients that we've done. What you see here is um, baseline OCAR, or oxygen consumption rate, and you can see that there's a statistical significantly different uh, amount of OCAR at baseline uh, in our patients compared to our healthy volunteers. As you know, there is a second study visit to this where we do an exercise challenge, and we are also doing these seahorse measurements in a serial fashion um, before and up to 72 hours after an exercise challenge using uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And uh, as a little teaser here, I'm just showing you some of the early results from that where we see that our healthy volunteers in terms of both spare respiratory capacity and max maximum respiration um, have sort of upward trends after 24 hours exercise um, that we're not quite seeing in our participants. While it's very hard to draw any firm conclusions from this data at this point in time, it does suggest that these kinds of measurements are worth continuing pursuing. The second example I will give you today is the immunological profiling we're doing of both peripheral blood and cerebral spinal fluid. Again, this is uh, run by our collaborators Yoshimi Akahata and Steve Jacobson at the viral immunology section. And this is an opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do with the cerebral spinal fluid samples we collect. Uh, we collect uh, lumbar punctures here on all our patients during that first week, around 24 milliliters of lumb, uh, spinal fluid. And that fluid is immediately separated. Um, the actual cell-free fluid is uh, siphoned off and frozen for further analysis. But the cells are immediately used um, to do uh, flow cytometry and immunophenotyping. At the same time we are drawing the cerebral spinal fluid, we are also drawing a sample of blood uh, so we can do a concomitant flow cytometry to understand the blood and CSF similarities and differences and really understand the immunological makeup of the, both of the different compartments. In terms of the immunological markers we're able to look at, um, this sort of gives you an overview sense of what we are looking at. Most of them are cell typing types of markers, looking at different CD cells, differentiating T cells into CD4 and CD8 cells, B cells, NK cells, and what have you. Um, we are also able to do uh, more detailed phenotyping to look at particular receptors on sort of C T cells in particular. Uh, one of the wonderful parts of this is if we find things on these flow cytometry analyses um, that lead us in a particular direction, we can change our column and make it more detailed to further investigate any changes that we see in this interim analysis. 
I'm going to provide you an example of what the flow will look like um, and some of the unique advantages here of our program. Um, the NINDS program has a long history of studying neuroinflammatory diseases and have a wide range of data um, across different inflammatory diseases which will allow for comparison. And so in this, these examples, I'm showing you samples, I have a pointer, uh, blood and CSF, and these are CD8, four CD8 ratios uh, in those patients. Our normal healthers or healthy donors are seen here. These are uh, HCLV1 um, demyel uh, demyelinating patients, HIV patients, MS patients, PML patients, other neuroinflammatory disorders, and here's CSF. And you can get a sense of where CSF patients sort of compare across these measures. Um, not too different here from healthy volunteers. Um, and that's in the blood, and you see sort of the same here in, in cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we look again here as looking at it NK cell frequency, and we don't see much differences in blood or in the CSF in either of these cell types. However, when we look here at sort of B cell measures, what we see is healthy volunteers and CFS participants are not so different in terms of blood, but you really get a bottoming out here, and very few B cells seen in the cerebral spinal fluid of all of our participants. Uh, while we do see decreases compared to the other neuroinflammatory disorders in, um, from our healthy volunteers, um, it seems pretty low. And we see this again reflected in our B cell monocyte ratio measure here, but that's because this is a B cell measure. Uh, where this will take us is not 100% clear at this point, uh, but we believe that our interim analysis will help us focus, uh, find these differences, and better focus the study going forward. A lot of people ask us uh, how busy we are, and so I'm providing here sort of an idea of what we have upcoming. Um, a visit one takes around two weeks per participant. Um, we have three healthy volunteers scheduled and two MECFS volunteers scheduled going forward. Um, our visit twos also take around two weeks, and we have two MECFS healthy volu uh, volunteers returning for their exercise challenges on the schedule. Um, there has been a little bit of changes to the protocol over time. I think we're on Amendment 11 to the protocol now. Um, and we've recently been approved to bring some of our completed participants back um, to complete measures they didn't have. And so if they didn't come back for a visit two, we are now allowed to bring them back for functional magnetic resonance imaging, transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, performing electroencephalography during sleep in the metabolic chamber, and for skin and muscle biopsies. Um, and we've also gotten approval to add these to our initial visit as options, so people who come in, we can get them during their first visits. Of course, uh, we could not do this work without the volunteers um, from the MECFS community. And again, we really still need your volunteerism. We cannot do this work without you. This is our website. Our phone number is listed here, our email address, and our internet. Uh, please get in touch with us, and uh, we're happy to talk to you and, and look at your medical records. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge um, the clinical team I work with um, that has direct patient contact. Um, Angelique Gavin, who's in the audience, is our clinical operations manager, um, really a wonderful person. Uh, many of you have probably talked to her on the phone. Um, Anita Jones is our senior research nurse um, and uh, does a wonderful job with all of our patients to make sure that uh, all their needs are taken care of. Uh, Joy Kreskow is our nurse practitioner on loan from the National Institute of Nursing Research, who does a wonderful job and keeps me in line. Uh, and the bottom are our ERTAs, our Institutional Research Trainee Awardees. These are uh, people that graduated college and are trying to figure out what comes next. And they've all decided to take two years with us to learn about MECFS. Uh, Benjamin Coleman has uh, finished with us and has gone on to medical school. Ashley Williams is finishing up her second year with us and will also be going on to medical school. And uh, Bryce Calco is going to become our senior ERTA. And we have a, a new ERTA starting soon named Snigga. Um, and they've been wonderful with our participants. This slide here is to acknowledge uh, the greater role that NIH has here in our protocol, um, all the different institutes that are contributing personnel and resources to the program. Um, many, many people are involved in this, and we are grateful for all their participation. 
I'd like to make a special shout out to the nurses on 7 Southwest North and, seven, uh, and 5 Southwest North uh, where our patients are housed, uh, who take wonderful care and make sure that our patients have a, a good experience here at NIH. Again, I would like to thank our expert adjudicators, Lucinda Bateman, Andy Kogolnik, Anthony Komaroff, Benjamin Nadelson, and Daniel Peterson, um, for whom uh, we are greatly in debt to provide the time to do these adjudications. And again, an extra special thanks to our MECFS and Healthy Volunteers, uh, for without whom there would be no program. Thank you so much. Do you? Um, are there any questions? It, it, thank you, Dr. Wallet. Excellent presentation. And for the rigor in the methods recruiting the patients and the implementation of the trial. Um, and as you have corrected for duration, given that patients will have to be with the illness more than six months, but less than five years, there are um, published data that suggests that the severity of the illness may impact the um, results. The more severe patients may have some biological signals greater than the mild patients, and then when you average them, they may affect the comparison with the controls. Is severity being uh, taken into account uh, by a measure, and finally, on the analysis of the results? Uh, we collect very detailed information about symptom severity as best as we can, both in subjective and objective ways, and we will look at those data in conjunction uh, with all of the other data we collect. Um, you know, a good example of this is with our exercise stress portion. Um, you know, we, we already know that the way that people describe how they feel and the way that they answer questionnaires often do not align. And so that we have a qualitative interview coupled with symptom questionnaires, coupled with our biologic measures of function and biology at multiple time points. Um, marching through so we can look at all those issues, how symptoms and biology uh, interact. Um, it's a particular interest of mine. Hi there. My name is Lila Rosenthal. I'm a family physician in Colorado, and I treat many patients with ME. And I have a patient who just did, completed her second visit as part of this group. And I just read her email yesterday to me, kind of summarizing her experience of two weeks being here and poked and prodded and everything. And I just wanted to let you know like how extraordinary this opportunity is. I'm sure you know this, but I want you to hear it. And I want to say it in front of everyone, like as a practitioner, for my patient preparing to come for her second time. You know, we would we meet monthly and she would talk about the anxiety and the enthusiasm. And now to have heard it on the other end, like this is, it's an unbelievable opportunity and I, I appreciate it so much more now too, hearing from you about it. Um, so thank you for one. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I just hope that you can grow the number of patients you can take on and I also wanna put a plea in to see younger people too. I have an 11 year old boy who I would just love to get in here, but I know his age is an exclusion criteria. Is it something you're thinking of opening up to a younger group? Um, you know, sometimes you, you start down the road and, and you find the paths that you need to go to uh, once you start that journey. Um, the idea that pediatric cases and people that have had it for long periods of time, that people with uh, very severe cases all need to be studied and understood. Um, that, that's pretty clear. Uh, but we have to start somewhere. And so we're trying to start with this sort of clean, small cohort uh, to help us give us guidance and to help us design those studies in the future. I wonder if ch uh, National Children's National could take on um, a, pro a similar project. Are you able to replicate with other institutions in the area? to encourage that. Uh, we are always open to sharing our methods uh, with other uh, institutions. Um, I know we've been approached by the, the VA system um, to talk about taking this approach to the study of Gulf War veterans. Um, and we would be happy to share sort of our view of things um, with anybody that would be interested in talking to us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Becky Torog. I'm a person with ME, and I also am a biochemist. I used to 
actually do research. Um, I'm just curious about the NK cells. I assume that you're also looking at NK activity, not just at the total number of cells. I know you were just showing a tiny bit of. But yeah, I'm just we, we do we do uh, functional assays on the NK cells. We'll be doing uh, uh, transcriptomics on the NK cells. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll numbers and flow. Um, you know, the, the interest in NK cells makes it impossible for us to ignore, and so. Uh, I think we even have a collaboration with an Australian group that studies NK cells if we need to go that route. And you're still looking for healthy volunteers as well? Yes, we are. Um, and always looking for people who, um, family members of people with MECFS, um, to match up with their participants and help us, you know, have as many genetically similar individuals. Um, this kind of uh, exploratory, small discovery work would really benefit from that. <coughs> Hi, Dr. Wallet. I have a question about the exclusionary criteria. Mm -hmm. We know that autoimmune thyroid disease, depression, anxiety are very common and sleep disorders in MECFS patients. So from your slides, I'm presuming that if someone has controlled thyroid disease, anxiety, depression, they would be part, they could be part of the trial. If uh, we had to exclude um, the descriptions of depression and anxiety from the study, we would be excluding about 40% of the American population. Right? And so, uh, you know, controlled thyroid disease on medication, uh, controlled uh, mood disorders, those things are all included. Our, our, you know, we expect that almost in our normal participant. Um, what we're, all, we're excluding are really sort of uh, more extreme cases, you know, people that have had uh, electron convulsive shock therapy, um, institutionalization, things like that. You know, we, we, we try to keep it pretty uh, dealing with the extremes in our exclusion. Thank you. Brian, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I've reported that about 30% of uh, spinal fluids in uh, MECFS have abnormal protein or high cell counts. Uh, what did you find? Uh, we have not quite found that yet. Uh, we're, again, the interim analysis is starting and we'll be sending um, our, uh, these uh, samples are being sent for an uh, analysis called somalogic, uh, which sort of breaks down the, the, into around uh, 1,100 different immune chemicals and proteins to get a sense of sort of the range that we're seeing there. So you there haven't have been, done the regular laboratory the regular cells laboratory and protein? Work we have, and the regular laboratory work has really not shown um, any differences between the healthy really? volunteers and the Thank participants. You. Although we have found two individuals with oligoclonal bands in their CSF uh, uh, that can't quite be explained. Thank you.